Today, I will be mainly talking about some recent advances in Gaussian processes. Uh, so most of these papers are available on my website. And uh, if you need to contact me, please, this is my email. And th th those are this is the Twitter account uh, where, where I publish some of the recent news about the research. OK. Uh, so today, I'll be talking about two things. The first thing is the Gaussian process and then the multivariate Gaussian process. And I will end by what I believe are the main open problems in, in Gaussian processes. I'll talk about two specific points in Gaussian process. What should be the objective function that we optimize over? The second thing, what is a plausible inference procedure that can scale? And then for the multivariate Gaussian process, I will introduce the notion of negative transfer. And then what are models that can avoid this negative transfer of information and scale to large data sets? And finally, I'll talk about a setting called weakly supervised setting, where we have a multivariate Gaussian process, but we do not have labels. So first of all, I want to start with an overview of the results. What are the main results that I will argue for today? First of all, for the objective, I will argue for using the following objective of the Gaussian process. This is not the exact objective that people use in the Gaussian process, but rather it is a lower bound on the exact objective. And as you can see, somehow it's a combination of two different matrices that I will discuss in a bit. Then for the inference procedure, I will argue for the use of stochastic gradient descent. Mini batch optimization is not theoretically grounded for use in correlated settings. It's only grounded for the use in, in situations like deep learning where we have this empirical loss function. But I will argue that you, we can use STD in correlated settings and we can derive very good convergence rates. Then for the MGP, for the multivariate Gaussian process, I will show that in order to avoid negative transfer, and negative transfer is the notion where you, when modeling things together, you, you, you lose information rather than gain knowledge. So I would argue to avoid negative transfer in a multivariate Gaussian process, you need n latent functions if you have n outputs. And that's a lot of latent functions, even in moderate settings. And hence, I will then argue that you need some very clever structures in order to be able to scale to high dimensional settings, specifically a pairwise and then arrowhead structure. And finally, I'll talk about, about this weakly supervised setting, where if we do not have labels in an MGP, what should be done? Okay, just a fast introduction for the Gaussian process. Rasmussen, Williams and Rasmussen define a Gaussian process. This is an old definition as a collection of random variables, any finite of which have a joint Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian process is mainly parameterized by a mean function. This is most often considered to be zero and the kernel. This kernel models the relationship between the, the, the outputs most often as a function of the input. And it is also parameterized by some parameter, which we often optimize over to understand the behavior of this Gaussian process. Then given those latent functions, y equal f of x plus f, we know that this is, we know that y has some additive noise defined by epsilon. So that the last function or, or the likelihood of our data is, is the well-known marginal likelihood in the Gaussian process where you integrate over f and you could recover just the marginal likelihood of the Gaussian process. And here kff is just a big covariance matrix that tries to understand the correlations and the relationships between all the data points in your data set. Okay, so it's very important to note that the Gaussian process is really parameterized. The covariance in the Gaussian process really plays a big role. It defines how the function will look like. For example, in the RBF kernel, this is a well-known kernel. Theta one is known as the variance scale. It, it, it somehow defines how, how far the function will be away from its mean. And then the length scale will define somehow how wiggly the function is. So really getting good estimates of the parameters is key. To, get to, to, to do great inference model selection and prediction in a Gaussian process. After finding the theta or finding your hyperparameters in a GP, prediction, predictions become simple, everything is Gaussian. So if you condition on a Gaussian, this is a multivariate Gaussian distribution, the condition distribution is still Gaussian, and hence we can recover a predictive distribution that is normally distributed. This is one of the key strengths of a Gaussian process, whereas it gives us a way to do uncertainty quantification, a very, a very, flexible uh, uncertainty quantification, specifically this Bayesian interpretation. And this really had led to, this, to the great success of Gaussian processes. 
uh, they have they have a long history. This history has seen a lot of successes in optimization, most recently specifically in Bayesian optimization. In reinforcement learning this year, in, in uh, the, the best paper in, in ICML was one that uses Gaussian processes for reinforcement learning, time series forecasting. Calibration is, is, has, a, has a long history in, in Gaussian processes. And most recently, we have seen a lot of deep learning models are basically just Gaussian processes, specifically in their limit, or if you have a, a, just, just a few layers. So really, the history of the Gaussian process is, is, is very rich. And, 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 and the recently, people are, are looking at, are, are really uncovering some new value that we have not seen before. So the first topic I will talk about is the Rennie Gaussian process. Specifically, I will try to answer the following question. What is the objective function that we should use for Gaussian processes? This is based on these two papers. Both of them are under submission. Uh, so let's, let's go back to, to the Gaussian process. Basically, in the Gaussian process, when we want to estimate our parameters, we try to maximize our exact likelihood. This is our exact likelihood. It's just our covariance matrix plus some additive noise. So what is a problem in, what is a small problem in this exact likelihood? There is no regularization. So you can think about it in the last function, for example, in a linear regression, we somehow add the lasso, we have some regularization effect to avoid overfitting. However, the, the last, the exact likelihood has, has, has shown that it really somehow can overfit. It has some critical points that do not have a lot of meaning. Somehow, some critical points just say that the entire noise, the entire data is just noise. So the question is, can we add some regularization to the exact inference? And really the answer came in 2009 by, by Titsias. Very beautiful framework. Titsias just said, okay, let's instead of using the, the, the marginal likelihood, let's use a variational, let's use a variational bound or let's use variational inference to find a bound on this likelihood. So this is a lower bound on this likelihood. And basically the only thing that was done is just using the KL divergence. So instead of maximizing the, the instead of maximizing the, the marginal likelihood, here we are somehow maximizing, minimizing the KL divergence between the approximated posterior and the true posterior. And it turns out that the lower bound on the last function has the following form. So what is this form? This form has two parts. The first part is very much looks like the exact likelihood, but it has Q. Q is just a low rank approximation, also known as the Nistrom approximation of KFF or the, of the covariance matrix. So Q is based on some latent variables. I will talk about them in a little bit, in, in a bit. And then you have some regularization effect where it is somehow trying to force the Q to be very close to KFF. So this, this bound really had a lot of success and people started shifting from using the exact likelihood to this variational bound. The two advantages for this bound, first of all, are Q. So here Q is a low rank approximation. If KUU is, if the number of latent variables that we have is much smaller than F, this, in, this inversion is, is, is low rank and it's uh, using just a shared complement. And then you have this part, this part is just a trace term. So there is no inversion. So really this is a low rank approximation and it can scale to some extent. The second part is the regularization effect. Indeed, the estimators that, that were derived from the variation inference empirically were, were much better in, in most situations. So what is these, what are those U? U are just a set of latent variables. So for example, if you have these outputs, we assume that those outputs somehow are related through this set of latent variables. And very much often the number of latent variables that we have M is much less than N. So to make this inversion good. And finally, you, here I should note that U in the variation inference is just integrated out. So eventually your kernel, this kernel K, U, K inverse UU is really based on just the input points that you choose, or perhaps just the Z. So those input points, you can just choose them uniformly over your space, or you can just, or you can even optimize over them. The intuition really is that if this latent function that you have is, is smooth, then you do not need a lot of data points to represent this latent function. You just need some sparse input or the, 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 the cardinality of your U is, is small. So this is basically the, the new bound that was derived via the variation inference framework. So what is variation inference? Let me, before moving to the Rennie divergence, just explain a little bit how, how did this bound came into, into place. So variation inference is basically trying to find 
an approximate posterior distribution of your latent functions f and u that somehow approximates the true posterior, the probability of f and u given y. And we do that by minimizing the KL divergence. Specifically, we assume some kind of a distribution, a controllable distribution Q, and our goal is to find this controllable distribution so that we are able to minimize the difference between an approximated posterior and the true posterior. So basically, variational inference really switches this Bayesian setting into an optimization problem, whereas we are finding distributions, but through optimizing or minimizing a divergence problem. Okay. So basically, if you want to find this optimal distribution, this is the minimization of the KL divergence. Equivalently, it can be written as a minimization as of, of the, the exact loss of the loss function minus a lower bound on the loss function. And obviously, you can it is easy to see that this is a lower bound as the KL divergence is positive. So basically, you can derive a lower bound on the loss function. And instead of optimizing this loss function, basically, you are optimizing a bound on this loss function, okay? So this is the process of doing a variation inference. It's a pretty simple process. We are basically just minimizing the KL divergence between a variation distribution Q, which we do not know, and the true posterior uh, uh, defined over F and U, given our data, okay? So the question remains, okay, we have those two bounds, or we have these two objectives for the Gaussian process, but which to use? It's really unclear which one is needed for better generalization. Interestingly, there a new paper argues that sometimes exact inference is, 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 is really detrimental to the process of learning, because if you're doing exact inference, you have no regularization. And in the same paper, they argue that you cannot just make, you cannot make a, a lower bound, arbitrary lower bound, and just optimize it. Really controlling this lower bound is very important. And another paper, and there is a lot of papers that, okay, argue, although variation inference adds a regularization, but that, that doesn't mean that it's better than solving the exact problem. And recently we have even seen a push in trying to solve the exact problem, going back to this exact problem and solving it in a better way. So the question is which to use is really a very important question. And, and it really goes back to just the idea of regularization, much like the lasso. We need to tune how much regularization is needed for the model. We need to tune what is our lambda. So what we do is we propose an alternative bound. Basically, our, the idea is pretty simple. We started off by the idea, let's, let's instead of minimizing the KL divergence, let's minimize an alpha divergence, or, or specifically the Rennie divergence. The, the Rennie divergence really is, it consists a larger class of, of divergence, for example, the Bacher, Bacheraya divergence, or even the KL divergence. And it turns out, interestingly, after some algebraic manipulations, we can, we can find the lower bound on the exact loss function. This lower bound is given as the following. And after doing some algebra, this lower bound looks like this. This is a very interesting lower bound, why? Because as you can see, it has two parts. The first part is a convex combination between the exact loss and a low rank or the Nistrom approximation, which we, we saw in the variation inference. And the, and the, 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 <clears throat> this, the way, and they are weighted by alpha. So alpha here is between zero and one. And then we have some regularization term that's also somehow controlling how different KFF is from Q. Okay, so this is the alternative bound. And the most important part of this bound is that we have alpha. This bound can be tuned. Whereas, you, whereas if alpha here, if alpha here is zero, we recover exact inference. We recover just the exact inference. This entire thing, if alpha is zero, we get the exact GP. If alpha goes to one, we recover this variational bound. So, so really this regularization effect is playing those two roles, whereas you, you, you are able to recover the exact, you are able to recover the variational bound, and somehow you are able to tune the regularization of the model. But the question is that remains, so this definitely adds some computational burden because right now you are tuning and you're trying to find your optimal parameters. I will discuss how to solve this problem efficiently in a bit. But before that, let's ask those questions. As the sample size increases, will our lower bound approximate the true posterior? If yes, what is the convergence rate? And the second question is, how many inducing points do we need? 
perhaps if we need inducing points, if Q, we need a lot of inducing points, then even the variational framework doesn't make sense if we need inducing points or M to be very close to N. So, so here we derive the rate. Basically, the Tokyo, I, I will not go a lot into the details of this specific rate, but basically this rate is dependent on three things. First of all, the number of latent functions that you have, the number of latent points that you have M, the total number of your data points, and finally, the eigenvalues of your kernel or your operator or, or, or of your empirical kernel. So those eigenvalues will depend really on what kind of, of uh, kernel have you defined. For example, if I define the Gaussian kernel, then I will have an eigen decay. If I define a, a matern kernel, then we will have a polynomial decay for the eigenvalues. So those three, those three uh, uh, parameters do control the divergence. However, one interesting point is if, we if, if n is large enough, this divergence can be made arbitrarily small. Okay. So let's take a very simple example where we have the RBF kernel. The RBF kernel, we know. We know the, uh, the, the, the eigen decay. We know exactly the eigenvalues of the RBF, the, uh, RBF kernel. And it turns out, as you can see, the divergence is controlled by n. It can be made arbitrarily small by n. And this is the divergence when the number of inducing points is a function of log n. So what does that mean? This means we are able to make the divergence arbitrarily small if we, if, if we use big O of log n. So we really need, we need some kind of a constant multiplied by log n. And this is very good news. The fact that we only need log n is, is, is very encouraging because it is saying that we do not need a lot of data points in, in, to use this inducing approximation. However, this is not true for the matern kernel. The matern kernel is not smooth, and the number of inducing points that are needed becomes n to the power t. Okay. So another interesting result here is base risk. So we define a risk function over the variational parameter, and it turns out that indeed minimizing the Rennie divergence also maximizes base uh, also <coughs> minimizes base risk. The, the interesting part is this same thing cannot be said for the variational inference, for the traditional variational inference for KL divergence. Basically, you need a lot of identifiability assumptions on the parameters. Okay, so let's look a little bit about the benchmark models. We benchmark with really the, the state of the art, the current state of the art that scales Gaussian processes is called exact Gaussian processes using fast matrix multiplication. This paper is called Gaussian processes with a million data points. Then the, the variational, the variation Gaussian process and the power expectation propagation is a new approach that was recently proposed. And this approach somehow uh, wraps up most of the work on fully uh, on these FITC, PITC, or these low rank approximations. It gives them somehow a, a valid theoretical framework, the power expectation propagation. So inter interestingly, on all these data sets, we find that, that our Rennie divergence derives much better results. And more interestingly, it turns out that the best alpha is very often very close to 0 0.5. So really, it's somehow a balance between this exact inference and, and this low rank approximation or the Nistrom approximation. Okay, and, and this same thing has been, has been seen earlier for a classification problem where, where, the, <clears throat> where a, the coefficient of 0 0.5 was able to give very tight bounds on the error probability. So this is a very interesting observation. We did not investigate more into it. We just did something. Let me discuss this part, what we did. So recently, flatness has been seen to be very important in generalization. So basically, flat solutions tend to predict better than non-flat solutions. And this is an observation that many people in deep learning has, have observed. And there is a lot of algorithms. One of, one of the algorithms we recently proposed is, is, is flatness learning rates. So learning rates that are somehow based on flatness. So there is a lot of push for finding flat solutions on deep learning. And what we did is we tried to replicate those settings in our Rennie divergence. And we indeed find that the solutions recovered when alpha is 0 0.5 are much, much flatter than that when, when you have extreme alphas, for example, 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. This is an interesting observation. This is something we are currently working on to really understand why 
at 0.5 or, or whenever you have this regularization, why can you recover flatter solutions? Basically, it is, it is somehow understandable intuitive, intuitively because variation inference is basically if it's smoother on the last function. So if you smooth a lot, then you somehow make the very critical points unclear. But if you do not smooth at all, you will have very sharp solutions that do not generalize well. So th there is this balance, which is why we need to tune. And this balance can be driven by getting better flat solutions. This is just a, 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 a hypothesis that we are still testing. Okay, so this is for the variation bound. The second question that, uh, that we will talk about is stochastic gradient descent. Can we use stochastic gradient descent for correlated settings, specifically in Gaussian processes? So this is based on, on, on a paper called Stochastic Gradient Descent in Correlated Settings, a study on Gaussian processes. Uh, so really scaling GPs is a problem that dates back more than three decades. It's a very long problem. We see daily papers about better estimation of GPs, scaling GPs to higher dimensions, scaling GPs to more data points, scaling MGPs. We have seen a lot of approaches, inducing points, pseudo inputs, variation inference, covariance, covariance tapering, kernel expansions, and many others. However, I, this is a personal opinion, but I do think that till now we have not succeeded to scale Gaussian processes to where we are, what is needed. Indeed, the state of the art right now is only able to solve just a couple of million points, and it takes more hours and using eight GPUs. So th basically they use state of the art GPUs, they do some parallelization, and they spend hours just to solve one million points. But deep learning is far ahead. This is why I, I said this opinion, okay, perhaps we have not succeeded. And, and can, we, can we, in some sense, uh, derive, borrow some of the success of the deep learning to that of the Gaussian processes? So just to review the literature, this is definitely not an exhaustive list. This is, this is, uh, this is uh, some of the main uh, appro approaches for, for scaling Gaussian processes. So there is, first of all, the sparse approximate in, uh, inference. This has a long history. It is basically based on low rank approximations, also some covariance tapering. And, and, and the least complexity they reached is an OM squared N. And if you have structured grids, you can have the complexity as a linear complexity here. Then we had the variational inference. Variational inference, as, as you can see, is, is really inverting a low-rank matrix. But I think the closest we got to really scaling a variational inference or really scaling GPs is what we call stochastic variational inference. So basically, stochastic variational inference tries to light, uh, try, write the loss function as, as, as a summation over the, over the latent functions and the data points. And then it does batch sampling. So stochastic variation inference indeed was able to scale. Unfortunately, some results show that indeed, also our results show a similar result, that the number of inducing points that you need is super linear with the dimension. So if you have very large dimensions, then somehow you're not gaining any benefit from the stochastic variation inference. More recently, as I mentioned, there is this push on using GPUs to scale exact inference, to scale exact GPs. We have seen a lot of approaches in fast matrix multiplications, some fast Chilovsky decompositions, and definitely there is the old research and, and also recently it has been updated, the kernel expansions, most of it based on this uh, um, uh, Love theory where they, they, they expand the kernels into some linear summation and, and they can reach big O of n log n. So the question that we ask here is, so for deep learning, what really scale deep learning to, to, to billions and millions and millions of points? SGD is one of the key propellers for scaling deep learning, indeed. And not only did it scale deep learning, it turns out that SGD also improves generalization. Why did it improve generalization? Because when you take many batches, you have higher variance, and it turns out that higher variance is able somehow to jump over these local minima, uh, uh, over these sharp local minima. So basically, it turns out that SGD recovers flat solutions, and hence it generalizes well, much better than larger, uh, much better than using larger batches or, or second order, third or, uh, or second order optimizers. This is a very interesting observation. The question that we really ask ourselves, can we use SGD in Gaussian processes? What the caveat, however, is this is not an empirical loss minimization problem. You cannot write your loss function as a summation over your data points simply because you have correlation. So in empirical loss minimization, 
the gradients are unbiased because we have the summation. However, when you have a Gaussian process, when you have a, a when you have correlation, your gradients become biased. You have also you still have non-convexity, but what happens is you have biased gradients. So what happen? How can we can SGD really give us something meaningful in such situations? This is the specific question we answer. And indeed, this lack of understanding on, 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 on how SGD performs in correlated settings has long stood in the way of really scaling up GPs. Okay, so, so just our findings, we find that indeed SGD under, under our conditions, we have some simplified conditions, we do some empirical testing on, or on, condi on more relaxed conditions, but our, on our simplified conditions, we find that Indeed, SGD can converge to a critical point of the loss function at rate one over K. This rate is a rate of strong convexity, which is a very interesting rate. More interestingly, it, it has statistical error, which is larger than that of SGD, but very interesting that the statistical error that we find is a function of the batch. Here, M is the batch size. So the statistical error turns out to be a function not of n, as in n as n increases, the statistical error uh, goes away. It turns out that the statistical error is a function of n, and this statistical error basically is is really due to uh, this correlation, the existence of correlation. So what you lose is you is you lose some kind of a statistical error, but but the optimization error or the rate of convergence is still one over k. This this really this finding really has really we, I do strictly believe that this opens up a whole a whole new data size regime for Gaussian processes scaling beyond what we have thought possible previously. And I will show you that we were able to solve just two million points of a Gaussian process on a regular computer without any 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 GPU just within thirty minutes, and indeed we got better generalization results. So what is our set setting? I do not want to go over the theory a lot. But we use a simplified setting, whereas we have just uh, this. This is our kernel. This is just the loss function. This is the gradient of the loss function, and this is our kernel. Specifically, we define that the kernel has some uh, exponential eigen decay. We have another new result on on the say on the situation where the kernel has matern uh, has a polynomial eigen decay, and the result and the and the rates are still the same. This is the stochastic gradient. <coughs> So basically what you do in stochastic gradient descent, you sample some points from your set, you sample a batch, and instead of calculating the true gradient from your entire data set, you just calculate the gradient from a batch and move your parameters in that direction. So definitely the, 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 the stochastic gradient needs to be scaled by some, uh, some parameter. The most natural choice is you just divide it by M. However, interestingly, we find that for the <coughs> While for the noise term, you need to scale by M to recover good theoretical properties for the length scale and the variance scale, you need to somehow divide by some, some number proportional to log M. So this is basically for theory and, 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 and indeed it turns out that different parameters due to correlation need, need different scaling in, in Gaussian processes. So what are our assumptions? Our assumptions in this specific theory is that we have an exponential eigen decay uh, we have bounded iterates. This is a common assumption, and our stochastic gradient is also bounded. Uh, so here is the convergence. This is the convergence of the full gradient. As you can see, the, the gradient can be made arbitrarily small uh, as a function of k, which is the number of iterations with a statistical error of, of m to the power minus half. Indeed, this result, we do not assume any Lipschitz or any convexity on, on the last function. This is a very interesting result that we got. And, and, and the statistical error I, I need to reiterate here is basically due to the correlation. So this correlation is, is forcing the statistical error to be a function of, of our batch size. We also, we also have some theory on recovering the true parameters. Indeed, it, it turns out that recovering the, 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 the variance scale is a bit harder and it, it has a larger statistical error than that of recovering the, the noise variance uh, for our results, okay? So some practical considerations. I, I, I just go, went over the theory a bit faster, so to, just to save time. But for the practical considerations, first of all, we try to answer a couple of questions. What is our sampling scheme? I think sampling, how to sample in a correlated setting is a very important problem. We do not have an optimal answer. Our results indicate that Perhaps if you sample nearby points, if you have stationary kernels and you sample nearby points, you get faster convergence rates. 
But I think sampling, when using SGD, how to sample in correlated settings is a very interesting research topic. So here also, I, I would like to note that for, we use SGD just to recover the true parameters or, or just to estimate the parameters. However, in the prediction phase, we cannot use SGD. So in the prediction phase, we, ten, we just used uh, a, ne a nearest neighbor based approach. We just took points in a neighborhood of the point that we want to predict and just used these points in that neighborhood to do the prediction. There is a lot of methods that currently exist in the literature on faster predictions. And, and the, the, the good thing, the good news in the prediction, this is a one shot and not an iterative procedure like uh, doing model selection and inference, okay? Um, so what are some open problems? I think one of the open problems that are very important here, we assume that our kernels are fixed. Uh, the parameters inside the kernel is fixed. So for example, we know our length scale, but we do not know our variance scale. So this is a this is a big challenge on how to prove the convergence, for example, of the length scale. And the, really the problem is that the, 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 the empirical kernel and the derivative have different eigenvectors with respect to that parameter. And this makes the problem very challenging. We try to extend this problem into a more realistic situation, whereas we sum, we sum, we sum over multiple fixed kernels, but we have different variance scales for these different kernels. However, we had to use the assumption that all these kernels have the same eigenvectors. I think this is still an open problem. And if this problem is solved, this is equivalent to finding the length scale. Because if you have sufficient kernel, a summation over sufficient kernels, you will be able to recover also the length scale. And the last question is how to sample. What is a good way to sample? Um, so here are just some simulations on using stochastic gradient descent. Uh, just to recall that we, we <coughs> There, there should not be a comma. So we, we normalized the, variant, the gradient of the variance by M and we normalized the gradient of, of, the, of the variance scale by log M. And these are some of the statistical errors. As you can see for the noise variance using SGD, we, can, we are able to really get very exact results and the statistical error is very small. However, for that of the variance scale, the statistical error tends to increase. It's a function of log M to the power minus half plus some epsilon. Okay, so those are the results. We try to compare with the state-of-art approaches, specifically for the exact Gaussian process. Uh, we use the sparse variational Gaussian process. We also use the stochastic variational Gaussian process. And we find that stochastic gradient descent not only is able to solve these problems in a fraction of time compared to all others, and, and most of the other techniques cannot really scale to a million points. We also find it gives much better prediction results and more accurate uncertainty quantification. And this result is really not surprising. This is something we have seen in deep learning. We have seen in deep learning improved generalization when using mini-batch optimization. And basically, this improved generalization, people have tried to explain it from a flatness perspective. So let me just show you one, one setting. This is 2 million data points with 10 dimensions. We were we're able to solve it in just more than an hour. Without, use, without using any GPU, any GPU acceleration. And we were able to achieve much better results than the state of art in, 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 in those data sets. Please, please note one thing that although our kernel is, is a simplified kernel that we use here, all in, our, all in our simulation settings, we just use either the maternal kernel and or the exponential kernel, and we do optimize over the parameters within the exponential. So this shows that indeed, the convergence can happen for all the parameters, but the theory right now is basically for the length scale and the noise term. And the noise and the, and and getting some theory for the noise term is, is really an interest is is really was really a very challenging problem. It, this 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 problem took us more than two years trying to to get some convergence results. Okay, so this is for the Gaussian process. Uh, so just to summarize, basically what I tried to argue is. We can use a tunable bound, and tuning this bound can be done using a, an, a scalable inference mesh method, and this inference method is stochastic gradient descent. Okay. So the second topic I will talk about is the multivariate Gaussian process. So what is the what is what is the multivariate Gaussian process? The multivariate Gaussian process is trying somehow to predict, to borrow strength across different functions to predict one specific function. And interestingly, when you have multiple functions and you model all of them as a multivariate Gaussian process, uh, 
not only you can interpolate, you can extrapolate because extrapolation somehow becomes an interpolation, an interpolation across signals if they share the same domain. So multivariate Gaussian processes really also recently have gained a lot of attention, not recently, but in the past decade. And basically, they're just trying to provide a bigger covariance matrix that somehow models the correlations across all the data points in our setting. So just some history about the multivariate Gaussian processes. Basically, they started by a separable, con uh, MGP started with a separable construction. So what is a separable construction saying? It is saying that the, that the covariance between the data points so all the outputs share the same marginal covariance and the difference is this specific constant. So there is a constant which dictates how different is the covariance function across different outputs. So this, is, this started off by this linear model of corregularization. Cor Unfortunately, it has one very strict assumption is that different, different, functions, different functions share the same marginal covariance. So somehow you are forcing the functions to act in a very similar way. So for example, if you are trying to extrapolate in here, somehow you are forcing these two functions to have a similar length scale, and hence you are not able to get the exact prediction. So somehow it's forcing correlation, the separable construction. However, interestingly, just this is a very old idea. This, this, this idea was first proposed in 1981 uh, by Verhoff. It's just, and this idea says that instead of constructing a Gaussian process by directly specifying the parameters and the covariance, just somehow <coughs> convolve a Gaussian process, perhaps just a noise, with a smoothing kernel. Under the condition that the smoothing kernel is absolutely integrable, then you can recover a Gaussian process. And this is basically just the convolution is a linear operator. This is smoothing kernel. So this is just, just a linear filter. And the condition is that the linear filter is stable. But what is the interesting part of this construction? This interesting, this construction has gained a lot of attention in the multivariate Gaussian process. Why? Because if you share multiple latent functions across different convolutions, then each output can, then you can model everything as a jointly Gaussian distribution, but more interestingly, each output can be described via its own kernel. So you can think about it here. So this, this is the latent function. This kernel convolves this latent function in a specific way to recover S1. This kernel recovers it in, in, in a different way, and this kernel recovers it in another way. So basically, you have this more flexibility to be able to handle this unique properties of, this, of different functions. And you can definitely share more than one latent function. So instead of having one latent function, you can share multiple latent functions in this uh, construction. And based, based on this convolution construction, you can derive the covariance. Here the covariance the expression is very simple because I assume that the latent functions are independent and their covariance is just a direct delta. However, one can use just, uh, just can assume that the, the latent functions in, in themselves also follow Gaussian process. So interestingly, this same graph when predicted using a convolution process is able to better recover the truth. And the reason it's giving more flexibility for the model, instead of forcing correlation, it's letting each output to have its own length scale and hence giving this more flexibility to the model. Okay, so this is just a brief overview of the convolution construction. However, when, when we are modeling with convolutions, and actually convolutions turns out to be really a very generic model, and all these separable constructions and the linear model of corregularization turned out to be just specific cases of the convolution construction, specifically cases where the kernels are just direct deltas. Okay, so what is negative transfer? So basically when we want to model using a convolution process, we are trying to say that we believe our outputs have some heterogeneity. So they have some unique properties. Then this raises a very specific question. Should these outputs be modeled together from the beginning? And if modeling them together, can you lose information or get worse predictions than modeling the, each one independently? And indeed, this can happen. In this specific small example, <clears throat> Because this is a very smooth function, the prediction is forcing the other function to be very smooth. And this even happens, this, this can happen no matter what, using a convolution or a, or a different construction based on your model and based on the latent functions that you have. So here we try to ask the question, what, when can we have a model flexible enough to avoid negative transfer? So to do so, first of all, we define negative transfer. <clears throat> 
So basically, the definition of negative transfer is 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 the following. I, I I will try to read the definition and then explain it in detail. Consider an MGP with n possible outputs and assume y i represents our target output. Okay. So and assume the outputs compromise of m non-empty disjoint sets. So there are um, some m groups. Then we can define the information transfer as the as some risk measure of the prediction of the prediction of y i using all the data versus the prediction of yi using a subset of this data. And if this is positive, if this risk is positive, that means there is negative, this negative transfer is occurred. So just think about the extreme situation. Consider we are using all our data and just, just that specific up output, we are modeling it independently using a GP. So if modeling independently using a GP achieves better results using all the data, then definitely negative transfer has occurred. So how can we avoid negative transfer? The answer is pretty simple. We need to have a model flexible enough that is able to predict this specific output that we are interested in given all the data using only the, uh, the output that we are, that, that are correlated with this specific, uh, with that specific output that we are interested to predict. So for example, if all the outputs are uncorrelated, there is no correlation between all the outputs and they should not be modeled together. We need to have a model that is flexible enough to collapse to independent GPs. So the prediction should be equivalent to predicting each output separately. Okay, and uh, from a normal distribution, this, this definitely will only happen if your covariance, if you can have a covariance of zero for b across all the outputs, uh, I, M, and, and between the output that belongs to this group of correlated outputs and the outputs that are not correlated with this specific output. Okay, so this is just a definition of this question of the negative transfer. And here is what we ask ourselves. We ask ourselves, would an expressive kernel and an efficient inference procedure for finding good parameter estimates automatically avoid spurious correlations? So this question is really motivated by recently there has been a lot of proposed inference procedures for MGPs. We have seen a lot of kernels, specifically those mixture kernels, and, and the, we really ask this question, are the kernels able to avoid bad correlations or not? And the answer is, is, is the following. The answer is that the only way for us to, to be able to avoid spurious correlations, no matter what the kernel is used, actually our, 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 our theorem here is based on a huge set of kernels. We prove, the, we prove this result for all these kernels. But we, all, we prove that you are able to avoid negative transfer if and only if Q is greater than or equal to M. So the number of latent functions that you have here is greater than the number of correlated subsets or outputs. So you can think about it in reality, we do not know what is the number of correlated outputs. So basically we always need our Q to be larger than the, to be greater than or equal to the number of outputs. So this theorem is, is very, very intuitive in one direction. So obviously, if we have n latent functions, if we have n outputs and we have n latent functions, it's very simple. Each output will be will be uh, will be modeled using its own uh, using its own latent function. However, the interesting result is necessity. We cannot prove the other direction. It turns out that all these kernels, those fancy kernels, cannot cancel out somehow their correlation to avoid this negative transfer. And no matter how flexible they are, for example, this, this, this spectral kernel is the most, is the current state of art kernel for the MGP. It's a summation over multiple latent functions. They are not able to somehow to cancel their correlation to avoid this negative transfer. And this is the interesting result, the necessity of this condition. To avoid negative transfer, we need n latent functions. Okay. So given this result, <clears throat> one can directly ask the question. Here I want to add a remark that that having um, n latent functions does not imply that the model will perform well. It just implies that the model somehow spans this hypothesis space or has a, has a solution that is able to avoid negative transfer. But your, your inference procedure can still get stuck in bad critical points or it can still get bad results. So this is just our intuition here is to try to understand what is a model that is flexible enough to achieve this specific condition or as 
to, to collapse this big MGP into its correlated components? This is the question that we ask. Um, so here, what are some induced challenges? I will try to move a bit faster because I want to talk about some open problems in GPs. So what are some induced challenges that, that happen when we need N latent functions? So if we need N latent functions, the number of parameters to estimate really skyrockets. So for omega here is the number of parameters within each kernel. And note those, those spectral kernels are summation kernels and they have a lot of parameters. And those parameters are also dependent on dimensions. So really this quadratic growth in the number of parameters is a big problem and it makes estimation in a, in a high dimensional setting very challenging. That being said, I want to note something that over parameterization in deep learning turned out to be very beneficial, turned out to convexify the loss function and give us very nice results. Specifically SGD and over parameterization turns out to work as a charm. So it might be the case, we have not tested it, that even if we have all these parameters and using SGD, this is a solution in itself, okay? So just to, to, to handle these problems here, we propose two different uh, structures that can achieve the two things. Two things. The first of all, can, can avoid negative transfer of knowledge. And the second of all, they are able to reduce this increase in parameter space. The first one, I call it an arrowhead matrix, an arrowhead relaxation. So in this arrowhead relaxation, if you are interested to predict output of one, basically we assume all the other outputs are independent. So your covariance matrix is like an arrow. You have just, this is the output that I want to predict. So you have only these diagonals and you have here um, uh, those outputs here. So in other way, you can think about it as a directed, as a, as a directed acyclic graph. Whether, whereas the loss of Y1 condition, whatever the, the, the likelihood can be decomposed as the likelihood of what we want to predict, conditional on all others multiplied by the individual likelihood of all others. So this really makes the complexity even smaller as, as the complexity of independent GPs. However, the increase in the parameter space becomes linear rather than quadratic. So another approach is, is to use a pairwise relaxation. Pairwise relaxation, the idea is very simple. Instead of taking or modeling all the outputs together, model them in pairs. So if I want to predict y1, model y1 with y1, y1 with y2, y1 with y3, y1 with y4 separately, and then combine the predictions. So this really can scale much, much better than, than the allohead relaxation because really the, the parameter space is constant. And also, in, and also this structure can avoid negative transfer because the number of latent functions is equal to n. So if you have two outputs, you can have two latent functions. And similarly, in the allohead relaxation, if you have n outputs, you still have n latent functions. However, the parameter space is much less because we're assuming the outputs that we are not interested in are independent. And then predictions after obtaining predictions. So here, basically, you have n minus one models, and you can just combine the predictions using using this rich literature of product of experts, Bayesian committee machines. There is a lot of literature on how to combine predictive distributions from multiple models. Uh, however, just let me note something. I, I I do not want to go into its theorem, but but let me just note something that one interesting point in these models, and really this is. This is a, 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 a this was a initial motivation for these models, is that they from these models you can also do some penalization, which allows variable selection. And here, when I say variable selection, it is the selection of which outputs are correlated. So, for example, if I penalize K and one, and if I penalize those kernels or their parameters, I can cut this connection. And if I cut this connection, I'm able to understand, okay, this output is not related with this specific output. And similarly, in the pairwise model, you can either penalize those shared latent functions that are short kernels that are sharing information, or you can just penalize the latent function itself. And interestingly, it turns out that those type of penalizations will give some consistent variable selection. And here by consistent variable selection, I mean consistency in selecting which outputs are related or unrelated. So this is a key part of, of those two models, whereas indeed they, they, they decrease the parameter space, but more interestingly, they are able to do functional variable selection as in selecting which functions should be modeled together or not. Okay, so here there are different ways to do these penalizations, but, but the interesting part is because this is a directed acyclic graph, if you cut off this connection, the inverse, the inverse covariance also will have a zero uh, 
in those specific locations. Okay. Um, so let me move a little bit to, to uh, some other topics. Those are some, so I, I'll just move very fast on some interesting topics that we have been working on in the area of Gaussian processes. This is more on the applied side. And then I will end by what I think are, are the open problems in Gaussian processes. So this, this is based on this paper called Weakly Supervised Multi-Output Regression via Correlated Gaussian Processes. So what is weak supervision? In general, for an MGP, we're basically assuming that that we have, we know that all the points belong to which output, but this is not always true. In many situations, we cannot have, we, we can encounter situations where the labels are not provided. And this is very common, for example, in, in, in disease groups. So for example, some people will, will prefer not to say what diseases they have, or some people will not say what race uh, the race. So we, we do not know the label or we do not know which, which, uh, the participant of the participant of or this data point belongs to which specific group. So the question that we ask ourselves in this situation, can we still recover the underlying curves? And can we somehow find the probability over the labels? And this is the motivation behind our, our model. Basically the model, we, we, we put a multinomial distribution over all the data points in multi multinomial as in it belongs to the specific to to each one of these specific groups and for the unlabeled data points we also put the Dirklet prior this this makes the the entire uh, uh, calculation intractable uh, the, calculating the exact posterior however here where variational inference comes in to help basically variational inference if you look at it from 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 another perspective it's helping us to solve these high dimensional integrals in a very nice way in an approximate optimization way and it turns out with variation inference you get a very this this very complex model boils out to a lower bound on the likelihood that is that has a closed form, has a lot of very nice interpretations on how, how the loss function is interacting. I will not go into detail, but this is one example. <clears throat> so this is our observations in this weekly supervised setting. And when we fit our model, we are, we are, able, to, we are able to really recover the true underlying curves without knowing uh, the, the, the outputs. So let me just here mention why we call it weakly supervised. Because why weakly supervised? Weakly supervised because you can, have, you can have zero information of the label, but you can have some prior information that you encode in the multinomial distribution. For example, you say that I believe that my, this specific data point is somehow with probability of 0 0.7, it belongs to that specific group. And, and, and this is why we call it a weakly supervised setting. So you either have absolutely no label or you have some belief state of that specific label that you are trying to, to find. So just let me just show you the specific example where, where indeed it's very hard to recover anything from the model. It's very imbalanced. We do not have a lot of labels. We basically just have one, two, three, four points. And interestingly, our model turns out to, to really act very well, and it specifically excels in situations where it is highly imbalanced. Uh, this is where, where our model really excels when we have high imbalance uh, problems. So this is also related to this data association problem, and we compare with a state-of-the-art data association problem, which is called OMGP, and, and it turns out, indeed, our model outperforms. Uh, so here, another note on, on our paper. Uh, that we also use variation inference or MGP to, to solve what we call joint models. This paper is called Joint Models for Event Prediction from Time Series and Survival Data. So basically, some, in many situations, we do not only have a, a longitudinal data, but, but we also have failure events. For example, you can think about these signals as the health signals from patients. And then we have some critical event that, has, that happened to a patient. And then our goal is, as we observe some new data, from a new patient, we want to somehow predict its survival probability or somehow the, the mean estimate of the time until the next event. And it turns out that multivariate Gaussian processes can play a beautiful role there. Whereas the key contribution of this paper is that for joint models, most of joint models are done in two steps. You first of all estimate the mixed effects model and then you estimate a proportional hazards model. But using the, uh, the multivariate Gaussian process and variation inference, we were able to find a bound to be to optimize both parameters simultaneously. Okay. So this is a summary of, of, of my presentation. Basically, I, I introduced an alternative objective for a Gaussian process. 
And I argued that this is the objective that needs to be used for Gaussian processes. I then discussed a little bit about how inference should be done. Can we, I asked, we asked this big question, can we use SGD in deep learning? Although our proofs are under simplified cases, but the answer is indeed a yes. In most situations, yes. And our empirical evidence also shows that we can use SGD. And really just using SGD allows, uh, allows GPs to scale far beyond what we thought is possible or what is currently possible. Um, and, and there are still some open problems. One very interesting problem is how to sample when you have correlations. And then for MGP, I, I, I showed the theorem that says that a necessary condition to avoid negative transfer in MGP is to have a sufficient number of latent functions, no matter how what your inference procedure is or no matter what your kernel is. Here I want to remind the audience that our results are under the most commonly used kernels and the most the state of the art. But however, it's an, inter an interesting open problem is to think about kernels that somehow cancel out or additive kernels that cancel out the correlation, whereas even with one latent function, we have enough flexibility to achieve, uh, to avoid negative transfer. Uh, and then I introduced those pairwise and arrowhead latent structures. And it turns out those latent structures, one of the key, mo the key behind them is they are able to avoid negative transfer. Uh, they are able to, to, to reduce the scaling of the parameter space. And finally, they are able to provide functional data selection or selection of which functions are correlated or not. Finally, I just in, ended with some applications of the MGP, some models, whereas you can use MGP in, in settings where you have no labels or in settings where besides the longitudinal data, you also have failure events. Okay. So I would like to end by open problems. What I think are, are some very important problems in GPs. So for me, I think, the most important problem currently for the GP, this is a personal opinion, is how to really scale GPs for high dimensional input. Most of the results right now uh, are, are really showing that when, you, when your input is very high dimensional, GPs do not really work well. And, 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 and perhaps the answer is really over-parameterized GPs. Let's have kernels that have a lot of parameters. Let's have kernels that are deep in nature, that do over-parameterization. So we are able to find a better representation instead of, of really bounding down this entire representation into, into, into a specific kernel with just a couple of parameters. This, I think, is a, is a big problem. I think this is, uh, this is currently... a. I believe is an unsolved problem for, for GPs and solving it, I, I, I think will really push GPs to compete with deep learning. The second thing is generalization bounds. We have some bounds. Those bounds are still not that typed. Interestingly, in deep learning, seems in the horizon, we, are, we will be able to get very interesting bounds. Currently, the deep learning bounds are improving by the day. And, and I do hope that this really translates also on for Gaussian processes. Uh, getting some tight generalization bounds. I just want to point out this paper that we have. It's called Why Non-Myopic Bayesian Optimization is Promising and How Far We Should Look Ahead. Basically, this paper uses a generalization bound on a GP to understand how much should we look ahead in Bayesian optimization. And this just ends to show why it is very important that we have some tight generalization bounds of, on GPs because it really will help in Bayesian optimization in developing very specific algorithms using Gaussian processes. And finally, I'll, I'll, I'll end with, with one open problem in, in theory, which is adding flexibility. I think one problem, and, and deep learning really showed us that when you have a lot of parameters and you over-parameterize a network, that's not a bad thing. Finding and the reducing the parameter space is, is perhaps not the optimal answer. So we have seen some deep kernels. We have seen some deep GPs. Unfortunately, deep GPs did not succeed as expected. Empirically, they didn't show good results. But perhaps some deep learning and, and some over-parameterization in deep learning can have a lot of impact and a lot of hope. So this is what I believe are some open problems from a modeling and theory perspective. From a practical perspective, I, I, I believe we still need two things. The first thing is a set of benchmark data sets for GPs. So creating those benchmark data sets for, for, for the recent models to somehow benchmark on 
understand the, the performance of GPs and understand how, how the models, how, how more recent models are improving uh, in performance is important. And this is something that's happening a lot in the machine learning and the deep learning community with all these benchmark data sets, for example, MNIST and CIFAR, where, where all the models are basically benchmarked on those specific data sets. And another thing is, is still for the GPs, we, we still lack some kind of a general purpose package, either in R or Python that is able to allow some tuning of the kernels, allow further tuning. Most of the packages we have are very specific to a specific problem in hand. And I do think that, that solving these theoretical problems and, and those practical problems can, can indeed push GPs to compete once again with 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 uh, perhaps the deep learning yeah. thank you a lot thank you for inviting me uh so this is my talk some theory i went over it a bit fast uh so i'll i'll, I'll stop here and 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 take questions okay uh thanks a lot for dr Contas in depth explanation about the advances in the Gaussian processes. So now uh, is the question and answer session. And if you have questions, you can open your microphone and ask directly to Dr. Quanta here, or you can leave messages. And uh, I can help you to, to ask the questions here. Okay, now, please, if you have any questions, and uh, p you can open your videos as well, and uh, it will be easier for communication. Uh, Dr. Kanta, I have one question first. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, and for the uh, last uh, example or, or your paper on the time series and the survival data, and you have the, uh, the, the Gaussian precise applied there, and uh, how, how is the performance comparing with uh, peer uh, methods or traditional methods? Because it's a kind of uh, typical uh, data site and you have uh, degradation of health uh, monitoring yeah. data. And also you have some failure data or death data. Yeah, and yes. uh, people have done some way to combine them together to do the survival analysis. Yeah, so this is in, indeed, there, 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 in joint models, there is a lot of work uh, yeah. on, on, on these, uh, basically the random effects Cox models. So what they do is they have some random effects model here that models the longitudinal data, and then the predictions are inputted into a, some kind of a Cox model or a survival model in order to do the estimation. Uh, so we do compare with, with, with most of the current existing techniques. And it turns out that our model excels and specifically excels in situations where the longitudinal data are heterogeneous. So basically when you have those parametric longitudinal models, you're assuming that most of your functions follow some parametric form. But in reality, that's not the case. And interestingly, when you have these convolution processes, as I mentioned, the, the key benefit of these convolution processes is that they are able to give different kernel parameters for different outputs. Uh, and, and, and hence, they are able to handle this heterogeneity in the data set. So we really find that our model really excels when our outputs are heterogeneous. Uh, another benefit is really joint estimation. We are able to find the bound on, on, on the last function of the Cox model combined with this longitudinal model. So basically we were able to find a, a bound on the likelihood of this specific hazard. This hazard is the, the, the Cox model and this is some kind of an MGP. And, and this, this bound is one of the kind currently. And why? Because most of these joint models will have some kind of a two-step or iterative training procedure. But using variational inference and the strength of variational inference specifically for Gaussian processes, we we're able to find a lower bound that allows us to estimate the parameters jointly and hence reduce the bias in this estimation because those two stage procedures were shown to be biased. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks you. for the question. Mm -hmm. So any more questions? Uh, uh, can I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Go, go please, ahead, yeah. please. Uh, this, is, this is Jing. Hi, oh, Ray. Hi, James, how, are how are you? I'm good. <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, very nice talk. I, I just have a question about your uh, one of your open problems. You mentioned the high dimensional challenge for GP 
primarily from a computational perspective, can you comment on what if the high dimensional input has lots of noise and uh, you know uh, sparse useful information, especially under limited sample size? Do you have any uh, comments yeah. about the challenges and potential solutions? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I'm 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 I. I I'm not very deep into this literature of noisy input. I do not know deeply about it. However, there is some literature on, on noisy input in Gaussian processes. Uh, I think indeed this is a challenge. There are some, some papers that somehow augment the covariance with some noise based on the input. Uh, but I, I, I still do believe that the, the challenge of scaling to, to higher dimensions is a very intrinsic and innate challenge of GPs. And solving it will 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 is is is, is of great importance. Uh, for noisy for no, noisy input, I think even some some models in, in in deep learning can be can be accounted for in 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 the in the Gaussian process. Whereas we can just somehow tweak or do some tapering tapering of the covariance based on the input space. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not very familiar with that set of literature, but but definitely this is an important problem. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Hi, Raed. Uh, this is Ray. Oh, hi, Ray. Yeah, yeah very good talk. Uh, I have uh, two questions, actually. So the first one is regarding your uh, stochastic gradient descent. So I didn't uh, quite follow the algorithm. It's just like a, a sample or a subset of, of, the, of the points and fit a small GP and use that parameter. Oh, so the stochastic gradient exactly. descent is basically we are trying to minimize the slot, maximize the slot function, okay? Yeah. Uh, or, or and this is the negative, so minimize the slot function. So at each stage of your uh -huh. optimization, you, basically you do SGD. So you sample you sample a subset of your points, a batch, and you find the gradient mm -hmm. of this specific batch, and you move along its direction. So, so in each step, you're up, you're you're inverting a very very small matrix. So, for example, you're okay, so the, 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 if you have two million yeah. points at each so step the of your optimization. The matrix change according to your sample, right? Exactly, exactly. So you're taking a batch, okay, okay. you're taking a batch and calculating the gradient just from that specific batch, and then moving at, okay. uh, with this direction. That's so, an intuitive idea. I'm, I'm surprised that this simple idea will work, yeah. Yeah, so so this is the problem, and this is why, why this SGD is very interesting, because... <clears throat> Let me just mention that, indeed, the problem of, of proving that, that SGD converges in Gaussian processes is a very challenging problem. We, we, we did spend a lot of time, more than two years, on, on trying to solve and proving this, uh, this theorem. And really, the, the lack of theoretical understanding behind the, the, the performance of stochastic gradient descent in correlated settings was the key reason behind not using SGD compared to, to, to deep learning, where in deep learning, the, the objective or the loss function is, is just an empirical loss. So the, the, the gradients are unbiased. And since the gradients are unbiased, you can take batches. Instead of doing uh, optimizing yeah. over the entire, you can just take batches. Yeah, indeed, this is a challenging problem. And I, I think this paper offers the first crack at this very challenging problem, yeah. Okay, great. That's a very interesting result. My second question is that it seems that, well, I, I didn't uh, uh, pay a lot of attention in uh, variational inference. Uh, I, I heard your talk and uh, uh, it seems it, it's a really um, effective method to solve a lot of problems. So my question is, uh, yeah, is there uh, any advances in like uh, uh, using variational inference to solve other kind of stochastic a process kind of modeling beyond the Gaussian process, beyond GP? Yeah, that's that's a good question. And and uh, variation inference right now is, is being used a lot of, in deep learning and specifically in Bayesian deep learning, whereas in Bayesian deep learning, they're putting some prior prior on the weights and, and they're trying to, to, to estimate a lower bound on the loss function of the of 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 uh, of the, 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 the deep learning network. But for other stochastic processes like general levy processes, I have not come across literature 
in that direction. However, let me just say that variational inference indeed has very recently gained attention. So in the past seven years, there is a really a boom in variational inference and all those somehow machine learning oriented uh, conferences have some kind of separate submission for variational inference. So I do think it has a lot of promise specifically in, 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 in statistical inference. The theory, the theory of understanding uh, variation inference is still sparse. I think there is only one paper on the frequentist consistency of variation inference by David Blay uh, uh, in Colombia, I think. Uh, but but still the theory is lacking, and I, I think th those results are, are one of the few theory on on this uh, on this uh, variational part. But but uh, mm -hmm. th to answer your question, I have not seen a lot of variation inference being done in general uh, stochastic processes like Markovian <clears throat> or or general Levy processes. Yeah. So basically, okay, things things are very nice when when things are normal, uh, but uh, th I think that's the problem. Yeah, I heard about this method a few years ago, but I did not pay attention at that time. But recently, I, I become more interested in it. So yeah. I, I need to learn from you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. Uh, Rajit, uh, this is you. Uh, oh, I have hi. a question. Yeah. Hi, professor. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. In your talk, you mentioned several times. So we need to develop some theory to enable uh gaussian process method to compete with deep learning but my question is uh, right now what things we can do with the gaussian process to better compare with deep learning what thing deep learning cannot do compared with gaussian process i think basically and this is this is this is a question based on empirical evidence that that that, that we have that i have been doing in coding basically in low data regimes Gaussian processes are very competitive for regression problems and not classification problems. Uh, Gaussian processes really excel on, on regressions for, for low dimensions where you only most of your variables are, are really continuous. There is this literature on incorporating qualitative variables, but I do not think it really ex achieves very, very strong predictive results. So I think currently, and this is unfortunate, but in practice, whenever you have larger data sets, indeed, deep networks are, 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 are stronger, are giving better results. Uh, but, but we do excel, the Gaussian process is indeed currently excelling on, on lower data regimes, uh, where, where, where you have basically regression problems and everything is continuous and smooth. Uh, I, I think one of the key advantages also of Gaussian processes is the, 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 the you do not need a lot of expert intervention. So for, for, for this deep learning, you really need to tune a lot. You need to tune learning rates. You need to tune your network. You need to, to specify dropout rates, weight decay, and many things. For this Gaussian processes, this tuning becomes much less. But to answer your question, Professor, I, I think one of the shortcomings is we are somehow summarizing our data into parameters within kernels. And this is something deep learning thinking is different. It's putting weights on every single point, not over every single point. It's, it's putting the, the number of weights more, in most situations by far exceeds the number of points. This over parameterization, although it is, it's not a common idea in our statistical thinking, it turns out to be a very effective idea in deep learning. I think this is the key. Can we over parameterize our kernels? Can we over parameterize our, 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 our loss functions to achieve better results? But they, indeed, indeed, just to, to go back to your question, I think uh, GPs right now basically excel on, 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 on lower data regimes and specifically in classification problems and, and regression problems and not classification. The classification results even in lower regimes are not that competitive with deep learning. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, any more questions? Uh, Dr. Kongta, I have a similar question uh, to Professor Zhou. Uh, you know, for the deep learning, uh, they have uh, great successful applications in, 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 in videos, <coughs> in photos, uh, and for the classification or some other applications. And uh, uh, what kind of typical application environment for the Gaussian process for the for the for the learning with these approaches? Do you have some ideas to share? <laughs> 
Yeah, this this also goes back to my answer. I think the yeah, success yeah. of Gaussian processes in classification problems mm -hmm. is is still somehow not has not surfaced clearly. Uh, and and yeah. and this is where deep learning excels. Most of the deep learning papers are basically just classifiers are doing classification problems. And and right now and right now with Bayesian neural networks and and there are some techniques that can recover uncertainty in a very principled and good way. For example, recently in our work we we tried to test the uncertainty quantification of of, of MC dropout, which is a deep learning technique to quantify uncertainty versus Gaussian processes, and we find and we didn't find an advantage of a Gaussian process in, even in lower regimes. And this is this is a bit discouraging. Uh, However, we had to tune a lot for the deep learning. We had really to tune our deep learning a lot to be able to get those specific uh, results. I think currently, as I mentioned, regression problems are where GPs excel, wherever we have continuous data, things are smooth. But I, I, I do think that I, I, I have to say that I am hoping with the use of SGD, and, and I do think deep kernels have a lot of potential and over parameterizing our networks, we can compete. I think the, the GP community is is somehow on the right track, but but we still need we still need some efforts to be able to compete with deep learning, and that's the truth of the matter. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, then, if no more questions, uh, we can conclude uh, this seminar, and. Uh, we are very thankful for the wonderful talk on Gaussian process by Dr. Quanta and uh, for the detailed explanation of the techniques and the open problems. And also we are very thankful for the audience from around the world and uh, in the night of Friday or in the morning of Saturday. Okay, thanks for joining. And if you are waiting to join the VIP talking after the seminar, you can check the room number on the poster and uh, we are waiting you there. Okay, then it's the end of the talk. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Kanta. Thank you everyone, it was a pleasure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye.